and this is the class, the Charophyce. We are still in the division Chlorophyta, but now remember Physi is the class ending. And in this case, Chara is a genus within this class, Charophyce. So, like Olophyce, the Charophyce is named after one of the organisms in there. Chara means graceful. And you'll see when we get to Chara on Thursday why the name's appropriate for Chara. So the Charophyce. The Charophyce, now we're in the group that is most closely related to the land plants. So we're going to start to see characteristics which distinguish this class from the rest of the Chlorophyta and which put them relatively close to the other, to the land plants. So these are the organisms where the nuclear envelope disintegrates at the beginning of meiosis, mitosis and meiosis, just like it does in the land plants. So they have a persistent mitotic spindle. Again, this is what you learned in introductory biology. It's true of all plants. It is actually true of the Charophyce now. Not of the other Chlorophyta, but of the Charophyce. And they have a phragmoplast. Phragmoplast. What's a phragmoplast? Phragm is fence. So that fence, and so that's something about, ah, this is the one where there's a fence where it breaks, the cell wall breaks the fence. And so that means that the phragmoplasts are those extra microtubules which are parallel to the spindle. Now, the higher plants don't have phragmoplasts. The land plants don't. But all these other characteristics, persistent mitotic spindle, nuclear envelope disintegrates. We also could say that the nuclei are relatively far apart during this process of nu uh, nuclear division. Those are characteristics that are shared by the Charophyce and the land plants. Um, so the spindle, if we have our two nuclei like this, and the spindle would run between them, the phragmoplast are some extra microtubules that run like that. So your notes might be backwards. I'm not going to try to correct them, but I'll tell you what this is, what the phragmoplast is. And so that means that when the new cell plate comes in, the new cell plate, there's only one way of forming, it comes out like this, and it breaks the phragmoplast, cuts those microtubules. The flagellated cells, they're not present in all of the Charophyce. In fact, there's two big groups of them. There's one with flagella and ones without flagella. We're going to do the ones without flagella today. But when they're present, the cells are asymmetrical and they have subapical flagella. Flagella are not inserted apically, they're inserted subapically. And they extend relatively at right angles, almost at right angles to the cells. They also have the place where they're anchored in, where those flagella are anchored in, there's this thing called a multi-layered structure because it's multi-layered. I'll show it to you in one second that's present at the base of the flagella. The life cycles are monobionic haploid, and there's a dormant zygote there. So we saw in the chlorophyce, monobionic haploid. In the charophyce, monobionic haploid. In the ovophyce, it's various. It's monobionic haploid or dibionic. And even in the same organism, I didn't emphasize this very much, but in a, even in the same organism, like in Bryopsis, you can have both life cycles. 
both there can be species of biopsis with dibionic life cycles and species of biopsis with monobionic haploid life cycles. So it doesn't distinguish there within the oophyce very well. But charophyce and chlorophyce have monobionic haploid life cycles and both have dormant zygotes. And now glycolate oxidase, that enzyme that is functioning in photorespiration, is present in the charophyce. And it's present in those organisms which are most closely related to the land plants. So these characteristics put think may, are why, one of the reasons why, some of the reasons why we think they're closely related. Can you go back to one more? Thank you. Okay. So what makes this group, Charophyce, similar to the other chlorophyta? Well, they've all got chlorophyll A and B. Starch is, fun is formed inside the chloroplast. We're going to see other groups, starting with the red algae, where that's not true. So that's always true of the green algae. And they have cellulosic cell walls. With no, there's not extra special compounds in there. So, there's these, so these characteristics unite all of the chlorophyta. Here's our flagella insertion. Remember the flagella here are at the top, or here's now in the charophyce, they come out subapically, and they're going to extend actually to the side of the organism. Remember that in the chlorophyce and the ovophyce, there is a cross shaped. System of microtubules. While in the charophyce, if we follow the flagella down, we come to a weird structure here. This is the multi-layered structure. <coughs> and there are microtubules then that run down the side of the cell. That anchor those flagella in. So the way the flagella are anchored into the cells differs in the chlorophyce, ovophyce versus the charophyce. The multilayered structure is called the multilayered structure because when you look at it in an electron micrograph, you can kind of see there, right? There's kind of little striations there. And so there are multiple layers in it. It's not microtubules in there. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Probably some proteination, some kind of protein. But I haven't seen a good description of it in the literature, except to say that there's a multilayered structure present. And here's the microtubule anchoring the flagella. There's the flagella. All the normal parts of the cell are there that we would normally see in these cells, nucleus, mitochondria, et cetera. But these are the ones we want that distinguish the class, and so I wanted to mention them. Here's our first organism. We are now dealing with the organisms in the charophyce which have no zoospores, have no flagella anywhere in their life cycle. We call these the azoosporic. Charophyce. A means not. So not zoosporic. And that is a reference to the fact that there are no flagella. So not only are there no zoospores, but the gametes are not flagellated either. So no flagella in any of these. And the first one you know because you took a picture of it the first week, and that's Spirogyra. How many people know the band Spirogyra? Yeah, that's what I thought. So now you know. You can go look them up. They're a jazz, a jazz group. They used to be um, quite popular, but that was a long time ago. I think they're still playing. They're good. They're very good. 
this, is, this brings us to a very important point that these names of these organisms are really cool names, like Spirogyra. Isn't that like great name for a jazz group? So I had a, I had a friend in graduate school who named his cat Anabina. Isn't that a great name for a cat, Anabina? <laughs> Anabina is a genus of blue-green algae. So your firstborn child, just think about some of these names as you, you know, reproductive years are ahead for some of you. There's some great opportunities here. I wouldn't suggest Spirogyra, but there'll be some other good ones. So Spirogyra is a filamentous organism. The cells are uninucleate. So it's not siphonous, it's not cenocytic. It is into cell. Filamentous means it's divided into cells. You can see the cell walls there. So we're back to kind of a normal organism. It's unbranched. And it's got a really cool chloroplast. Here's the chloroplast, and you can see it spirals up. So there is a spiral chloroplast. And these cells are all haploid. Now there's often two chloroplasts in each of these cells. In fact, it's kind of rare to see one chloroplast like that and the two chloroplasts spiral up in opposite directions. So we get that really cool spiral shape. Here's the chloroplast in three dimensions. You can see the ends of the cells here. And if you can get your eyes just right, you can see both sides of it. Probably you can see it better than I from the front. That is, you can see both chloroplasts in there spiraling in opposite directions. I'm sorry, they're spiraling in the same direction, but there's two of them. So the chloroplast is spirogyra. No flagella. So these guys got to figure out a way to reproduce without flagella. Of course, they can fragment for asexual reproduction, but sexual reproduction is by a process called conjugation. Con is with or together, and I'm actually not sure what the second root there is. It's actually a word that has a, has a meaning in English, conjunct, join together. So the root could be considered conjunct with the subroot con meaning with or together. But what I'm trying to say is that if you look it up in your root words, conjunct will be a official root meaning joined together. And then A-T-I-O-N is a ending which indicates it's a verb. It's an action, means it's an action word. So the activity of joining together. So there's different gametophytes. There's plus and minus gametophytes. Or we could just say mating strains. And they form these papillae. Which grow out to each other. I'm gonna, the papillae are going to fuse together. Here they are having joined a little more fully. And one of the cytoplasms of one of these cells is going to round up and it's going to move through this tube. So the joint papillae then become called the conjugation tube. Look at this over here. Little menage a trois going on. 
to see, wait until you wait and see what happens with that. <clears throat> yes. Papilli joined conjugation two. So here we have the mobile gamete, not mobile by flagella, but it's kind of an amoeboid movement. Moving through, and there's the process of syngamy. Going to produce our zygote. So we're going to end up with one of the filaments, which is empty because the gametes moved out. And the other, where we've got a young zygote. Now the zygote is going to undergo a resting stage. So we'll see in the next diagram that here is the resting zygote, thick walled. It's going to get even more thick walled in the next slide. A typical monobionic haploid life cycle. We're going to. Oh, good. Aren't we happy now? We have a test of the emergency system. Okay, good. I think we got back of there. Um, the resting zygote. And here it is again, the fully resting zygote. Yeah, you're all getting notified now. There is no emergency. So there it is. Result of the um, menage a trois. He can't make up his mind. Just a morale detail, guys. Just be careful about that. Zygnema. Zygnema has exactly the same life cycle and structure as Spirogyra. The difference is that the chloroplast, this is the group with really fantastic chloroplasts. Look at that chloroplast. They call those star shaped chloroplasts. It's like, suppose you got to call it something. But that is an amazing chloroplast. Two chloroplasts, like in Spirogyra, two chloroplasts per cell. But now there are these, whatever you call that, fantastically shaped, they call it star shaped chloroplasts. And they're beautiful chloroplasts. And it, you might see a little bit of this in lab. I, some years we have zygnema, and some years we don't. I'm not sure that's what's going to happen this year. But the main difference then is that we have two chloroplasts that are star shaped instead of those spirochloroplasts that we find in Spirogyra. It is still azoosporic, still reproduces by conjugation. It is just another example of these organisms. Another example of what I talked about earlier, this variation on a theme, right? We have a evolutionary theme established here. They have a nice niche, but they've been varied now in the way that the chloroplasts are formed in these two organisms. Here it is again. This is, again, three-dimensional and hard to see. I'll turn down the lights more. And now you can get a, a three-dimensional view of that chloroplast rotating. So really neat, three-dimensional chloroplasts. Some pictures of chloroplast and cell division next. Here's chloroplast division. So the cell is just divided. There's the new cell wall, and now the single chloroplast in each cell, and now they just went through division now to form two chloroplasts there. See if we can do it one more time. So there was the new cell wall dividing now the chloroplast to produce our two eventually star-shaped chloroplasts. Got some more videos of cell division in these organisms. Cl Clostridium is an example of our last group that we're going to be doing this week. And this group are called, these group are this group of organisms it's called the desmids. So there's a number of genera, and of course a number of species, in this group, the desmids. 
they are all similar. They have certain characteristics which are all similar to each other. One of those characteristics is that they're unicellular. But they're unicellular in a funny way, and I'll come back to it. So we're learning these organisms mainly as desmids. But desmid has no official standing within the taxonomic hierarchy. It just means there's a group of these organisms which are very similar and share characteristics to each other. Clostidium is one of those organisms. It's this kind of thread-like unicellular organism. I don't know why they call this thread-like, but I would say cigar-shaped unicellular organism. So they're unicellular in a special way like this. They are composed of two semicells. Now, the semicells are not really easy to see in Clostidium. They will be easier to see in some of the examples. I'll show here in Clostidium, but they're more easy to see in a minute. So the semicells are connected to each other by a central region. Here's that central region, and the nucleus sits there. They are connected by an isthmus. This region then is the isthmus. An isthmus just means a narrow place. So if you think about the connection between North America and South America, it's connected by the Isthmus of Panama. The land narrows down at that narrow place, the Isthmus of Panama, the narrow place of Panama. So that Isthmus then connects the semicells. Here's one semicell. Here's the other semicell. There is a cell wall at the Isthmus, a small cell wall. You can't see it well there, but there is a partially separated cell wall. But there is cytoplasmic continuity because the nucleus sits there. In fact, we'll see how this all works with cell division in a second. Here's some three-dimensional views of the chloroplast of posterium. Again, the center of the cell is going to be all vacuole. I don't know how you describe these chloroplasts. Better have a good term for it. They look, but they look like this. There's the cell wall in there, or the isthmus. And the two semi-cells have these rib chloroplasts in the two of them. You can see here very nicely the isthmus in this light micrograph. So here then is the isthmus. With the nucleus in the center. And you can also see that big vacuole. Microsterius, we have about one minute of material left and one minute of time. Here is Microsterius. There's a semicell. There is the isthmus. You can see that here. Here is the nucleus. Microsterius, micro little aster star, a little star. This shows cell division. So cell division is by mitosis. Followed by semi-cell regeneration. So the semi-cells are regenerated. And if you just follow this through, you'll see that process taking place. Again, this would be then the isthmus. OK, we're going to finish our description then of the Charophyce today and begin a new group, the Rhodophyta, the red algae. I'll say more about red algae and what we're doing in the future when we get to the very beginning of the Rhodophyta. But for now, let's finish up the Charophyce.
the class of green algae that is most closely related to land plants. And within the Charophyce, there are these two groups. We did one already, the azoosporic Charophyce, and now we're gonna do the zoosporic Charophyce. They're called zoosporic in this case, not really because they have zoospores, asexual, reproductive, mobile, gamp spores, but because they have flagella. So there are flagella at some part in the life cycle. And in these cases, it's actually the flagella that are on the sperm. So the, called zoosporic, but it's really the sperm here that has the flagella. This group, the zoosporic charophyce, are the group that is most closely related to the land plants. And of those ones in the land plants, it's this one, Coleochaetae, that in the molecular phylogenies comes out the closest. Now, it doesn't look much like a land plant. And the next one we're gonna see is gonna look a lot more like a land plant. So arguments have gone back and forth over the years about which of these are very similar, most similar to the land plants, but the molecular evidence tends to point in this direction now, even though the morphology is strikingly different from a land plant. But as I say, there are some technical characteristics of this. Coleochaetae, um, it means long flowing hairs. Coleo is a sheath. And Kiti is long flowing. <coughs> or long flowing hair. So a sheath of long flowing hairs. And it probably refers to these cytoplasmic extensions from the cell that are very difficult to see, except in drawings like this or in specially prepared preparations, which we don't have here. These are cytoplasmic extensions. They are not flagella and they do not make the organism mobile. The organism is not mobile, it's a flat sheet of cells. or a branched filament in a very strange kind of way of branched filament. I shouldn't even write that on the screen here on, because you should think of it as a flat sheet of cells. There are some cases where that flat sheet, you see here, it looks a little more branched filament. Here it looks a little more branched filament, but it always tends to have that flatty sheet of cell characteristic. It's never really filamentous like we think of a filamentous organism. So think of it as a flat sheet of cells with some variability within that. It is usually only one cell thick, only in very small portions of the organism is that violated, and it is epiphytic. Epiphytic means it grows on top of other plants, epi upon phyte plant. So it grows as a flat sheet of plants on the blades of other plants, like it might grow on top of an ulva or a red algae or many other kinds of things where there's enough enough space for that. And it's got those cytoplasmic extensions that give it then its name. So here you see Coleochaetae growing as an epiphyte. And you can see at the base of that, this is the, this is that other algae down here. I'm just gonna say other plant. It could be a, aquatic vascular plant, and then coleochaetae is that thing that's growing on top of it, the green stuff here. Coleochaetae. Now you can also see in coleochaetae there that there is a little place here where there's more than one cell thing. Mostly one cell thick, but there's a little clump of cells there. And that is, in fact, where the gametes are going to be formed. We'll see this more clearly in the next pictures. So here's coleochaetae, some different variations on it. And you see <coughs> here's that flat sheet of cells. And in a 
slightly different variation here, or a smaller variation with that. And then there are some organisms that look like this, which are just these clumps of kind of randomly cells. And you want to know which one of those you're going to see in lab? You're going to see that one. And the reason for that is because Coleoctetes grows as an epiphyte. And the material that we have in lab is grown in shaker cultures. That's how they have to grow these things. So that shaker culture you might know from molecular biology. So they grow them in suspension. And so it cannot latch on to any other material. And so it never develops its characteristic morphology. So it's very unfortunate that we rarely see a really nice Coleoctetes. Now, if you look enough in this kind of garbage material of Coleoctetes, you sometimes can find a little nicer one but you have to look very hard. So I'm, we've tried for many years to find better quality Coleoctetes to, <clears throat> to look at in lab, but because of how the organism grows, it's just not possible. So we can use illustrations from the internet to give us um, nice photographs. People spend more time than Carolina Biological, et cetera, growing these things, and so they get these nice pictures. Here's that group of cells where we have a more than one cell layer thick in the Coleoctetes body. And this, in fact, is the egg. So in this case, we have a very large egg. So Coleoctetes is oogamous. And Coleoctetes is also an example of a violation of one of the basic principles for algae that we taught you at the very beginning of the semester. So at the very beginning, when we started talking about algae, we said the algae are differentiated from the land plants because algae have no sterile cells around their gametes and land plants too. Coleoctetes and its other azoosporic charophyce are the exception to that rule. And this is one reason, while before, the, before we did molecular analyses, this is one reason why we started to think, ah, this group is probably the group that is most closely related to the land plants because it has sterile cells. So that's why there's this clump of cells over the egg. So there are here, if you can see there, that's a sterile cell. These are all sterile cells surrounding the gametes. I'm just gonna say surrounding the sex cells since that's how we put it first. That this, so it violates that, that general rule for the algae and makes these guys closely related to the land plants. Here's some more of them. So you hear, here you see, here's that disc that looks a slightly more filamentous. I'm going to write filamentous with a question mark. And also look down here. See there, again, still it's kind of a disc cell, but you can see that it's broken up into these filaments in this case. So it's got that little bit of a filamentous nature there. And here are then those long cytoplasmic extensions which give it its name. This is not three-dimensional, but you can see the chloroplast rotating here. This is sped up a little bit, but these are the cells then that would have those hairs coming out of it, those long flowing hairs. And at the base of those, there's a lot of cytoplasmic activity. So here you see that again, just in still photographs. There's those hairs coming out. Here's one here. And that chloroplast there would be rotating like that. So nothing really special about these chloroplasts. They look kind of cup-shaped, but it's hard to tell for here. Those questions about chloroplasts are there for things, because there are things like zygnema, where you want to say, whoa. We got to say something about that. This one you don't really have to say something about. Let's look at those sterile cells over the gametes again. So there's the egg again. Fortunately, I don't have a picture of the male reproductive organs, but we do have these nice ones of the egg. And there's the sterile cells surrounding it. So sterile cells just means they're not going to produce gametes. Those sterile cells are not going to produce gametes. They are just part of the vegetative, non-reproductive body of the plant. And they're surrounding the gamete. So 
to see. I've forgotten to tell you something. Same thing over here, here's the egg. And the sterile cells in this, this, this is a section through the organism. They don't show up quite as well, but these are then part of that sterile cells, sterile cell layer. Surrounding the gamete. Here it is growing on as the epiphyte. So here we have coleochidae. And then down below, This is actually a vascular plant, an aquatic vascular plant. And it's growing on top of that. We know it's an, a vascular plant because there's a little bit of xylem and phloem over here, which only the vascular plants would have. We can also see now in this, again, it's a section, that here is the egg, and there are the sterile cells. surrounding the egg. Other places, it's a single cell layer. Chara, our next group, our next organism in the Charophyce is the organism from which the Charophyce takes its name. Chara means graceful. This is a freshwater plant growing in moving streams, and you can just imagine that plant with its nodes and inner nodes, I'll define those terms in a second, waving in that current as it goes by, looking nice and graceful, giving it its name. So it's got a very unusual structure for an alga. This is not a vascular plant, this is an algae. It's related to Coleochete and the Charophyce. It has the same kind of reproductive structures we saw in uh, and coleochidae, although they're going to be even more elaborate here. So it's got a parallel origination of this structure of nodes and internodes. So a node, and higher plants have the same node internode structure. A node here means knot or swelling, and that's the place where branches are attached in this case or in the higher plants where leaves are attached. And then the inner node, this is a big inner node here. This is a smaller inner node here. Inter means between, so between knots or between swellings. Just the region where there are no leaves or no branches in this case attached. So the node inner node structure is a parallel evolution in this group and in the higher plants. But you can see why looking at this, people initially thought just morphologically that this would be the one that's related to the higher plants. These are branches, and we will see how they originate in just a minute, like right now. So here's Charles. This is a section through the apex. This is the vegetative. <coughs> apex of the plant, and we can see that there is an apical cell. And there is apical growth in this. I guess you'd call it a filament. You can call it a filament, but it's a very unusual kind of filament. So we usually say the plant body is composed of nodes and inner nodes and the, has apical growth. So there's an apical cell. What that means is that all the whole plant body is derived from that divisions of the cell. Well, 
Whole plant body is derived from the divisions of the apical cell. So this is kind of a cool thing happens when that is the case, and that is you can look down this stem right behind that apical cell, and you can see in space what's going to happen in time. So this cell is going to divide. This apical cell is going to divide. And when it, when it divides, the next cell that it's going to produce, or the next cells that it's going to produce that look that occur in this place are going to look like this. There's going to be a big cell produced there. And after that, there's going to be two cells that are produced like this later on. And then the next is going to divide again, and it's going to produce some cells like this, and then some cells like that, etc. It's going to go back and forth between those two kinds of productions. And as this cell, this type of cell, matures, it's going to get bigger like that, and then it's going to get bigger like that, and it's going to produce the inner node. And as, I'm going to switch colors. And as this pair of cells divides, it's going to look like that, and then it's going to look like that, and then it's going to look like that, and it's going to move like that down there. And that's going to produce the node and the branches. So there's a branch here again. So it's got this really cool method of apical growth. The main thing to remember there is that it's got apical growth and an apical cell to produce nodes and inner nodes. Here's the same thing again in another micrograph. And the main thing I want you to see in this time, we've got the apical cell again, besides the apical cell and the branches. Notice how complex those branches are. We're going to learn names for those, kind of, those kinds of branches in the next group in the rotophyta. Main thing I want you to see is what's going on in this lower diagram. If we cut a section through there and we looked at that section, we would see this. So there's a section. And it would look that. And there's the center part that that's the big inner node cell. I'm just going to call it the central inner node cell. And then there are surrounding cells. Again, all I'm trying to emphasize here is this node inner node structure and just showing you that this big central cell is mostly vacuole and it's that cell right there, a big cell. Here it is again. Here's that central inner node cell. Look at this, just there's the cytoplasm out here, very small part of the cytoplasm on the, on the periphery. That's all vacuole on the inside. There's the nucleus. These are the surrounding cells. So we'll have good material of this in lab for you to look at. It's really a neat organism. This is Nitella. I just have it here because we have a really nice picture of the chloroplast and the organism. Nitella is pretty much identical to Chara, except that there are some technical details about the sex organs, the structure of the sex organs that differentiate between them. We have often had Nitella in lab. It's not a required plant, but we do not have it this year. So, but I love the slide in because it's a, such a pretty slide. So it shows the nodes and the inner nodes very nicely. And the chloroplast. The next one is three-dimensional. It's showing the chloroplast. These are just the di normal disc-shaped chloroplasts in some of the cells of Nitella, again, very similar to Chara. The really cool thing is the next slide. Not so in this one, because this shows, I think there's some, yeah, it is three-dimensional, just barely, but you can see 
cytoplasm extremely. Now this is in that big central cell. We've been talking about that big central mutant node cell. And we're at the very periphery of that cell, and there are all kinds of chloroplasts out there, this little chloroplast, and this shows cytoplasm extremely, so it's streaming kind of around the cell in a spiral pattern. Like this. Of course, sped up, but isn't that neat? Okay, sexual reproduction. We have now differentiation, what well, we had in Chara also, Coleochete also, differentiation between the male and the female sex organs. And again, we're going to have sterile cells surrounding those organs. So let's look at, let's see, let's start with the egg, which would be at the center. And the whole structure is called the oogonium. I think you know those roots now. Egg reproductive organ or you know, egg reproductive organ is pretty good for that. On the male side, we have the antheridium. And in both cases, around the sex cells, we have sterile cells. On the male side, we have the sterile cells here, and of course they cover the whole, that whole, they cover this whole part of the organism and they are called shield cells. And are the sterile cells surrounding it. And on the female side, we have what are called tube cells. And again, they're the sterile cells. And at the top, there's a little crown and so we call that the crown in Greek, corona. Did you know the corona, not crown? Also in Spanish, a derivative. So the corona is what differentiates, the structure of the corona is what differentiates Nitella from char. Our important structures for us are to realize the egg and the antheridia are surrounded by sterile cells. That's the most important thing. Even the names are not that important. That main fact is important. Oh, by the way, is this organism hetero, um, heterophallic or homophallic? Male, female, catch the same one. Homo means, hetero means, homothetic or heterophallic? Homo, homophallic. Same. Same young shoot. Both or sex organs on the same young shoot in this case. Now, chara can be homothallic or heterothallic, depending on which group we've got. The ones we see in lab are typically heterothallic. Not always, but typically heterothallic. So, but this one, this picture, and many of the pictures we have here are going to be heterothallic. Here's the antheridia. I'm sorry, they're mostly going to be homophallic in the pictures. There's our shield cells. There are inside those shield cells, there are these filaments. These are the antheridial filaments. And here they are released. Here they are released. This is not a natural release of the antheridial filaments. This is the scientists taking an antheridium and squishing it under the slide so they don't come out that way. What actually happens is that the shield cells will open slightly and the sperm, which are in those filaments, each of those cells that produce a sperm, those will be released and they can swim out from between the open shield cells. So, when you see things that look like this, it's almost, it's almost always someone squished it. But it does show nicely the antheridial filaments. Here it is again in section, and we have sections like this. Homothallic or heterothallic, this version. You're getting it. Homothallic. So there's the antheridium. 
and the oligonium. There's the egg, the tube cells, the corona, and the radial filaments. I'm going to write that on the side, it's too hard to see. And the shield cells. Surrounding the antheridium. So sterile cells around them all. This is this place here, this is a node. And here's an inner node. And here's an inner node. So the sex organs are attached in a node. And there's often some branches there too. Same place. Same thing again, antheridial filaments. They are also, and there's the sperm. Well, that's <clears throat> meiosis taking place up here. Because this life cycle is monobionic haploid. Remember, that's the characteristic of this whole class. So this is a haploid organism, so the gametes are producing, being produced by meiosis. Mitosis, not meiosis. By mitosis. The egg in the center, the tube cells, and the corona. I said chrono was Greek, I actually think it's Latin. After syngamy, we get the zygote. And syngamy could be called fertilization correctly here. In the monobionic haploid life cycles, the zygote is resting. You can see it's kind of a thick wall. Chrono is a thick walled structure there. Meiosis occurs in the zygote. And here's the new chara. New haploid chara. Same thing over here, there it is, the haploid portion of the chara, there's the zygote. So thick walled, the light doesn't penetrate it well. And that covers the charophyces.